All right. So, um, how's the Diffie Hughes treating you? It's going all right, I guess. Um, I had one question uh, on 27B. Me too. 27, (laughs) was that B as in Bravo? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was actually B as in Boyd. Can you not? It's actually B as in Boat, Wes. Come on. It's uh, B as in Byzantium, you know. B as in Bruce. Don't mind me. I'm just going to flick Wes real quick. Can you feel that? (laughs) Flicked Wes. Beautiful. All right. Any others uh, other than 27B? Mm. Can we do 15? Uh, We'll put that on the list. Was it just me or did you guys all get like four of them were not exact out of the first five? <laughs> uh, three yeah, I got, of them. Yeah, it's like three of them. I got okay. three, six, and 12. Okay, so maybe 15 was exact. <laughs> yeah, I got exact for 15. Yeah. All right, all right so can you guys see my screen? Uh, my screen? It's currently black at the moment. Yeah, it just says Bruce Armbrust has started screen sharing, but that's what it all it says. Oh, oh, there we go. There we go. There we go. We can get now. Okay. Right now. Um, let's have a few of you share, and then I'll go last. All right. Which section are we in? Uh, 2.5. 2.5? Okay, I'm close. Yeah. All right, so number 15 just says we want to determine if this is exact. And if it's exact, we want to solve it. So let me write this guy up here. All right, so I'm going to quit sharing here. Let's go to the whiteboard. All right, so hopefully you can see it up here. So we've got this guy. We want to see if it's exact. So the test for exact is to differentiate the first one with respect to y and see if we get the same thing as if we differentiate the second one with respect to x. So if we look at my, so we've got e to the x squared plus y times this other stuff. So that other stuff is constants. And then we need to multiply that constant by the derivative of e to the x squared plus y, which of course is going to give us e to the x squared plus y. And then the 4x is a constant that's being added, so that's gone. So I think that's MY. So I look good. Yep. So now let's go to NX. So differentiating the second one with respect to X, I need product rule. So I'm going to get 3X squared times E to the X squared plus Y plus X cubed hmm. times the derivative of E to the X squared plus Y with respect to X. So that needs chain rule. So we're going to get 2x times e to the x squared plus y. All right, so how does that look? Does that look right? Mm -hmm. So the question is, are these things the same? Well, if we were to distribute that top one, we'd get 
two x cubed times e to the x squared plus y plus three x times e to the x squared e to the x squared plus y or sorry three x times that um, which isn't the same we're off by an x so this thing is not exact All right. <laughs> So I guess that makes Mikey quite happy. <laughs> In terms of what we're asked to do for this homework problem, this should make you happy because now we're done. But if this were a differential equation we were trying to solve, Thanks. I would not be happy because what am I gonna have to do at this point if I wanna try to solve it? You have to do a lot of, a lot of separation reports. So yeah, I'm gonna to want to try that integrating factor trick. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Multiply by something, see if I can make it exact. Yeah. And that's not anything I really want to do. But <laughs> for 15, we can stop and go. Nope, they are not the same. See, I was gonna use Larry's words and just say cry. <laughs> uh, there's no crying in differential equations. <laughs> there's no crying. We know this. Uh, that's reserved for linear algebra. Yeah, you can shed tears in linear algebra. That's fine. All right, so we mm -hmm. good for number whatever this was, 15? All right, so let's go look at 27B. So share the screen again. All right, so 27 part A was to solve the exact differential equation implicitly. Hopefully that went pretty well. Um, in fact, we're gonna go ahead and get that because I wanna use that to talk about B. But then part B says, for what choices of X not Y not, does theorem 2.3.1 imply that the initial value problem as a unique solution that contains X naught. So let me go ahead and write this guy down. And while I'm doing that, let me ask you, what did we need to be guaranteed a unique solution? That it was continuous and uh, within a rectangular area. Okay, so real quick, yeah, you said it needs to be continuous? The, the uh, parent function. Okay, so we have to have continuity of our, well, parent function. Basically what we get um, in our differential equation, right? With the y prime equals. We both got a pretty Don't you also know why not But there is something else we need because just that parent function being continuous, that isn't tells that like, us that we have a solution. Isn't not it like me. y of x not equals y? Why yeah. not? Yeah, I like that. So say that again, Mikey. Yeah. Uh, y of x not equals y not. Yeah. Okay, so that's our initial condition. Yeah. Okay. Isn't isn't it that the partial in terms of y has to be continuous uh, continuous also? Yes. So we need our partial in terms of y to also work. That's what it is. <laughs> All right. So you guys went ahead and found the solution. You integrate this first one with respect to x, the second one with respect to y, and you should get something like one fourth x to the fourth, y to the fourth plus x squared plus three halves y squared equals c. And let's go ahead and do our initial condition so we can find out what the c is. We know that when we plug in x naught, we get y naught. So we'll have one fourth x naught y naught to the fourth plus x naught squared plus three y naught squared over two. 
So that's our C value. So in terms of the solution to the initial value problem, I'm going to write it down here at the bottom. It's going to be one fourth x y to the fourth plus x squared plus three y squared over two equals one fourth x naught y naught to the fourth plus x naught squared plus three y naught squared over two. Okay, so there's our solution. But is it unique? So now what we need to do is go back and check 2.3.1 or whatever that theorem number was. So what we need is the parent function. So we can look at its continuity and then look at its partial with respect to y and check that continuity. So how do we find that parent function? Do you find the answer to the homogeneous first? Um, we don't have to do anything about finding a solution to the homogeneous. Isn't it our current solution that's right up on the board? This one? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, the one that you circled below. Yeah. It is not this one. It's not that one? I'll tell you what. Let me share my screen and we'll go to the book and we'll go find it. Okay, so we'll look and see, remind ourselves what that actually looked like. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna have to go back a bit to find that. Okay, so here's theorem 2.3.1. So F needs to be continuous on an open rectangle that contains the point. All right, well, we'll worry about that. In fact, that's kind of what we're looking for, right? Is what X naught and Y naughts are good. But what's special about that point, or I'm sorry, that function, is that that's the Y prime equals. So F of XY, it's gonna be whatever Y prime is equal to. And it's that thing that we look to check if it's continuous, then we know we're guaranteed a solution. But if it and it's derivative with respect to y are continuous, then we're guaranteed a unique solution. So that's the what Thea called the parent function. It's what y prime is equal to. So then you have to go back to that original function that we uh, the exact um, differential equation and then solve it for y prime essentially and move yeah. those differential bits sort of like separable uh, exactly. differential equations. Yep. Got it. That's exactly what we have to do. We take that original differential equation, alter its form so that it looks like y prime equals and then that's what we'll investigate in terms of continuity. All right, so let me go back to the board then. So let's do some algebra on this. So let's move the DX piece over to the other side and then we're gonna divide by DX. So we should get dy DX is equal to negative X cubed Y to the fourth minus two X 
divided by x to the fourth y cubed plus 3y. And so this thing on the right, that's our f. That's what we're looking at in terms of its continuity and also the continuity of its derivative. So before we actually do that, are we OK? Yep. Yeah. Just got to make sure we get it as y prime equals, and then we can move forward. All right, so let's start with this thing just itself. Let's find out where it's continuous so that we know that we're guaranteed a solution. All right, so since this is polynomial over polynomial, since it's a rational expression, we only really have to worry about where the denominator is zero. So let's look at that. So let's look at x to the fourth y cubed plus 3y equals zero. I can factor out a y. So we definitely see that there's a problem when y is equal to zero. Because when y is equal to zero, then we get minus 2x over zero, which is undefined. Our derivative is not existent there. So we need to make sure that our rectangles can avoid y equals zero. Well, as long as our y naught is not zero, we're going to be good there. Because no matter how far we are off of from zero, we can be as close as we want. I can still make an open rectangle that won't contain y equals zero. All right, so, so far so good. So then let's look at this other factor. What values of x and y would make that zero? Well, if you're having a hard time finding them, you should because there are no problem spots x to the fourth and y squared are always going to be positives, which then we add three, they'll never equal zero. Right? That stuff in the parentheses, the smallest that could be is three when x and y are both zero. Other than that, it's going to be bigger than three, which of course means it'll never equal zero. So what theorem 2.3.1 tells us is that as long as our rectangle can avoid y equals zero, we're guaranteed a solution. We still haven't answered part B yet of this question, right? Part B is asking us to actually determine where we're guaranteed a unique solution. But as long as we avoid zero, we know we're guaranteed a solution. All right, so let's go for the uniqueness. So I'm just going to write up here, we can't have zero. All right, so that means if we're going to look for uniqueness, we need to look at the derivative of this thing with respect to y. So if this is our f, then let's get fy. So we're going to have to use the quotient rule. But we'll take the derivative of the top, so minus 4x cubed y cubed times the bottom. Minus the derivative of the bottom times the top. So we're going to get 3x to the fourth y squared plus 3 times the top. And then we need to divide by the bottom squared. And we should probably do some algebra on that to see if we can simplify it. 
before we determine whether or not this is defined. Okay, so let me just distribute. We got minus 4 x to the 7th y to the 6th, minus 12 x cubed y to the 4th. The other one, ugh, we have to foil. Let's see. We're going to get plus 3 x to the 7th y to the 6th. And we're going to get plus 6 x to the fifth y squared plus 3x cubed y to the fourth plus 6x. And again, that's all over the denominator squared. So let me see if I can simplify that. Like terms. Uh, the first one and the third one are the same. So we get negative x to the seventh y to the sixth. Um, the second one is the same as the second to last. So that's going to be a minus 9 x cubed y to the fourth. And then the other two are what they are. All right, well, there's our Fy. Only thing we really could do is factor an x on top, but that's not going to cancel anything. And the rest of it, I'm quite certain, doesn't factor. So assuming that our algebra is correct, now let's look at this thing and figure out where do we have issues here. Well, go to the bottom, and you see that actually the bottom has exactly the same problems. And in fact, there aren't any other new problems because we're in that same situation where the remaining pieces are never going to be zero. Only when y is equal to zero will there be an issue. So the first part, when we just looked at f, told us we were guaranteed a solution if y wasn't equal to zero. And now this tells us we're guaranteed a unique solution as long as y doesn't equal zero. So basically, if we go back to the actual question, remember what it asked. It said, find the x not y not such that we're guaranteed a unique solution. So my answer would be x not y not will give us a unique solution as long as y not doesn't equal zero. So if we have an initial condition that actually passes through the x-axis, or is on the x-axis, I should say, then um, the solution that we have isn't necessarily the only one. And if you look at the equation, the actual solution that we found, come back here, think about what happens when y equals zero. We end up with x squared equals x naught squared, which is totally valid. But all that gives us is a vertical line, which is kind of boring because it'll give us an x equals. 
but that's what it would be if we had an initial condition that started on the axis. So is that better for B? Now that we slugged our way through. Yep. It's all good. All right. Anything else from the homework we want to look at? Hey, so hey, how, Bruce. Yeah, go ahead, Trey. Sorry. On on fifteen, I I got that uh, that it, it is exact. Did I botch my derivative? Uh, maybe. I, I checked the back of the book and I got they got the same answer. Well, most likely. Exact as well. Most likely I botched it. Let me go back and look. I might have even written it down wrong. I originally got that it was exact also. And yet you guys were all good with me saying that it wasn't. I, I wanted to verify are. before <laughs> I spoke up. <laughs> Coward. I mean, I put those derivatives in symbol lab and I got the same thing you got, Bruce. <laughs> so I don't know if maybe I just should have been wrong too. Oh. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to erase from the board the one we just looked at, 27B. So hopefully you got it written down. If not, go back and look at the video. Let me try this again. So we got x squared e to the x squared plus y times 2x squared plus 3 plus 4x. x squared e to the x squared plus y, 2x plus 3 plus 4x. Okay, and then we have x cubed e to the x squared plus y minus 12y squared dy. x cubed e to the x squared plus y. Okay. So I think I got it. Let's go take a look. Okay, so let's try that again. So we need MY. So MY, the four X we don't care about. That's constant being added, that's gone. The other bits we have X squared times 2x squared plus 3. That's all constant. And then e to the x squared plus y, its derivative is going to be e to the x squared plus y times the derivative of what's inside, which is just 1. So does that look right? Uh, yeah, that's what I got. OK, does that actually match what I did last time? Uh, no, the x was uh, to the first power. Oh, uh, OK. Thanks for catching that, guys. Appreciate it. Well, then I know it's going to be good. Because remember how we were off by a multiple of x? That would be y. But let's go ahead and get our nx. So we're going to use the product rule. So we're going to get 3x squared e to the x squared plus y plus x cubed times 2x times e to the x squared plus y. And then the y bits go away. And so now we're going to get 3x squared and 2x to the fourths, which do match up. All right, so I apologize. That was just a transcription error. Amazing what a power of 2 will do. All right, well, I guess 15 is exact, which is a good thing, because now we can go ahead and solve this thing. We just have to integrate with respect to x for the first thing, and then integrate with respect to y, the second one. Are you guys really going to make me do that? 
This is where we just go to yeah. Symbol Lab or whatever. I'll do the I'll do the second one. That's easy. The integral of n dy. That's going to be x cubed e to the x squared plus y minus 4y cubed. So that's going to be part. Um, let's just see what happens when we differentiate that with respect to x. We're going to get 3x squared times all that stuff. That's the 3x squared times all this. And then when we differentiate the second piece, we get 2x times x cubed, which gives us our 2x to the fourth. Uh, cool. Um, Hold on a second, guys. Someone is trying to call me. Which it's muted me, turned, turned off, off my off. screen. Okay, so are we seeing my screen? No, the no, camera you went off. Drinking a beer, looking at the sun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's what I wish I was doing right now. All right, there we go. Um, so what I was saying here is that, so I found the n integral. And then what I did was I real quick differentiated that with respect to x. Because I know that whatever I, whatever's in here, its derivative has to show up in the m part. And the derivative of the x cubed mm -hmm. e to the x squared plus y is actually all of this. So all we have to do then when we integrate, we're going to get x cubed e to the x squared plus y. And then we need the integral of 4x, which is going to be 2x squared. So I don't know if you exactly caught my little trick there, but I went with the one that was easier to integrate. And then I used its derivative to help me integrate the other one or integrate by parts or use symbol lab or your 89 or whatever. But that should be the integral of m with respect to x. So then when I put that all together, I'm going to get x cubed e to the x squared plus y plus 2x squared minus 4y cubed equals c which is probably what the back of the book shows. Yes. And now we're all good. All right, so I apologize for that. I uh, forgot an X. I somehow made that same mistake. <laughs> well, that means you think like me. And so I'm going to apologize for you because uh, no one should really have to think like me. It's frightening sometimes. All right, so we good with that. Any other questions from the homework? Okay, so something I was just about to ask when Trey jumped back in there. Um, so how are we feeling about the different processes? I mean, by this point now, what we have maybe five different ways that we've learned that depend on the five different forms. Um, Hopefully you're good with the individual process. Like if I, you know, if you recognize or if you're told, you know, that it's Bernoulli, for example, that you would be able to go, oh, okay, so for Bernoulli, here are my steps, right? Or for an exact, here are the steps. Or here's something that looks like it's exact. Here are the steps for finding integrating factors. So hopefully you're okay with the individual processes. And what's going to be challenging is more the how do we know which one to use, which is going to come to recognizing the form. So Monty put up in the chat, you know, how many will be on the exam? I, I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. I mean, I can guarantee you that on this first exam, I'm going to give you one that's exact. 
you know I'm going to give you one that's linear first order, right? Um, homogeneous or non-homogeneous, they're pretty much the same, just the non-homogeneous has one more step. Um, I'll probably, you know, I'll definitely give you separable. Um, I don't know if I'll necessarily give you a Bernoulli. Um, I'll definitely give you at least one, maybe two, where you need an integrating factor, because we've seen that has shown up in lots of different places, right? So um, you're definitely going to need to do that. And uh, I'm going to tell you which is which. Uh huh. Yeah, sure. No, what what it's going to be um, obviously is it'll basically be solve these differential equations. Have at it. Um, and obviously this kind of exam and the way that class is set up right now, um, just writing out an answer isn't going to do anything for me in terms of you getting the credit because you and I both know that there are online differential equation solvers where you type in a Diffie Q and it just spits out the answer. I don't care about the answer so much as you doing the process to get there. So um, definitely make sure you've got the different processes down. And the good news is that we're going to revisit them. I mean, we're going to see them as we go along, um, as we do applications, right? Like even if you think about what we did last time, just the simple uh, application of um, exponential growth and decay, that led to separable. I mean, it was kind of a trivial separable, but it led to separable. And we're going to see that today as we continue um, looking at applications. I'm going to show you some that we can separate, others that we that are linear first order. You know, um, it, it'll help keep this stuff fresh. But make sure you keep practicing them. And um, the biggest thing I can recommend is go with the here are examples, look at it, and try to figure out what type it is. Okay, so um, that's my biggest recommendation right now is just get used to recognizing when you have the different forms. So, hey Bruce, yeah. Are, will the uh, exact equations always look like that, where there's the, the dy and then the, the dx, like where the, they're split up like that? No, not always. Like, think about what we did for 27b, right? where we wrote it as, we switched it to dy dx. Yeah. Um, we could have started in that form, where we have dy dx equals that fraction. Uh -huh. Oh, right. And then the way yeah. you would have recognized that it's exact is if you had broken it apart. So um, I guess the short answer that I tried to make long is no, they're not always written that way. Okay. Um, and it turns out that sometimes, even though you could write it as an exact, you don't necessarily need to because there are other techniques that can take care of it for you, like separation and all that right so yeah um yeah but nope not always okay other questions okay well then let's do some more examples today um that's what today is just going to be a whole bunch of um here are more places where differential equations pop up so think about what we've seen so far we saw exponential growth and exponential decay, but they were the same thing, just talking about having a positive growth rate versus a negative growth rate, right? Um, so you change that K value, you get one or the other. And then I showed you compound interest. And compound interest is really just exponential growth because um, the K is your interest rate, and so um, it's quite the same. So let's change this a bit. In fact, let's keep kind of talking about growth and decay. But what if we have a mixture of it? What if we've got growth and decay? So let's go to the board. So what's going to happen if we have growth and decay? So suppose we've got a combination of it. Over time, it's either going to go up or down. So say that again, Wes, I'm sorry. Uh, over time, it's either going to go up or down. Okay, so you would expect that it's probably going to go up or it's going to go down. And, and what would determine 
whether it ends up going up or down. Uh, whichever, uh, if the rate is gr of growth is higher than the rate of decay or vice versa. Yeah. It's really, how are these comparing? So let's put some numbers. Here's how I think about it. We go with Q, our quantity. The change in that is going to be some sort of a rate of increase minus, well, let me write rate of growth minus the rate of decay. So let's go to that assumption that we had before where we were growing proportionally to the amount we had or decaying proportionally. So this is going to turn into a differential equation. It's going to look like this. We're going to have Q prime equals A times Q minus B times Q. But notice that if we just factor out the Q, this looks exactly the same. Q prime is equal to some number times Q, which means if we were to solve this differential equation, we're going to get Q equals C times E to the A minus B times T. So in this situation, it's really ex the exact same thing. And if you look at this, A minus B, that's going to tell us what happens long term. If that's positive, it's going to grow exponentially. If it's negative, it's going to decay exponentially. And that just depends on which of these is bigger. If A is bigger than B, we're going to grow. If A is smaller than B, we're going to decay, which makes total sense. A bigger than B means our growth rate is bigger than our decay rate. Yeah, our population, our quantity should grow and vice versa. So this situation where the growth and decay rates are basically what we did before, they're proportional to the amounts, um, they don't really lead to anything new. And they can actually be simplified down into just a single growth or decay, depending upon which one's bigger. But we could easily change this so that it isn't quite this simple. Like, what if we said, instead of having proportional growth and propor proportional decay, let's change it. Let's say that we know that it's growing at a constant rate. So it's not proportional on how many are there anymore. This would be something like, every year we get a thousand more sheep. Every year, a thousand sheep. So plus a thousand, plus a thousand, plus a thousand, plus a thousand. Or um, every year we get a thousand grams of lead 210. Plus a thousand, plus a thousand, plus a thousand, plus a thousand. Okay, so let's say it's growing at a constant rate, but it's decaying proportionally. Now what we would see is Q prime is going to equal some number, because we're adding that in every time, and then minus B times Q. So here's an example of where this would happen. Let's go to um, a nuclear power plant. And so every year, this nuclear power plant 
is using the same amount of, or producing the same amount of radioactive uranium. So every year we're adding in the same amount of uranium. But that uranium is gonna decay whether or not we're producing more of it. And so it's gonna decay proportionally according to whatever its um, decay rate is. And so if we were to actually model how much radioactive plutonium we're getting from a nuclear facility that's producing the same amount every year, it would look like this. All right, so how would you solve this thing? Would it help if I gave you some numbers? Are the A and the B throwing you? Not really. It's just like where to start, what sort of method to use. It's um, that linear first order. OK, this yeah. is definitely a linear first order. So we could use the techniques for linear first order. Remember linear first order, those are the ones that we can write Q prime plus oh. F of T yeah. or F of X times Q equals G of X. So, so unless A is zero, it's going to be non-homogeneous, right? OK, exactly. So if A is not zero, then this is non-homogeneous. If A is zero, it's actually a duh problem. Yeah. Because if A is zero, you notice that that's just your exponential decay. Yeah. Right. But yes, you're correct. If A was zero, that would be homogeneous, but otherwise it's non-homogeneous. Yeah. So let's remind ourselves the technique. So first we get Probably. first we need to get Q1. Okay, so we need to get a solution to the homogeneous. Yeah. All right, well let's see what that would look like. So if we have Q prime plus BQ equals zero. This one's going to be Q prime equals negative B times Q, which gives me Q equals E to the minus BT. And so we'll go ahead and call that guy Q1. The way that it worked, generalized it, is whatever this function is, we called it P. We integrate P, we then make it negative, and then we take E to that power. So that's why it ended up being E to the negative BT. But that was our Q1. All right, but goodwill. That's a good first step. We find the Q1, then what do we do? Uh, then we need to get um, U. Or, yep. Yeah. You so need to get a U. Be... U is what we're going to multiply to Q1. And how do you get U? Uh, we take the integral of G of X over Y1. Or, Q1. Okay, so the integral of, say again? Uh, it's going to be A over Q1. Okay, so you Since take your, our, whatever yeah. it's equal to, I think we call it G. But we're going to take that, we're going to divide by Q1, and then integrate that. So u is going to be the integral of a over e to the minus bt, which is the same as the integral of a e to the plus bt. I think that'll just be easier to integrate. So this becomes a over b e to the bt plus c. And now we multiply that by the e to the minus bt, 
And so what we end up with is Q is equal to A over B plus C e to the minus BT. And you can check that. You can check that when we differentiate that and add it to B times what we just started, we'll end up giving us A. Right? If you plug that into this differential equation, you'll see that it works. All right, so that's the process for linear first order. And the way that you're gonna recognize that is you're gonna have the Q prime and the Q, or the Y prime and the Y, or the whatever they are. But we're gonna be able to see that that Q or Y is only being multiplied by the, the independent variable, so T or X or constant, and then is gonna be equal to some other function of that independent variable. All right, so check this out. Let's look at what happens to this. So remember the idea this was some sort of a, or an example I told you would be, we're producing the same amount of radioactive material every year. And then we're looking to see what happens um, in terms of how much we have. And what we're gonna get is a function that looks like this, that does have its exponential. It's a negative exponential because we're gonna see stuff decay. But check this out. What happens to this as t goes to infinity? It's going to go towards a over b. Correct. The e to the minus bt bit is going to go away. And what we're going to be left with is a over b. So in the context of this nuclear facility, we're going to end up with long term a certain amount of this radioactive material. The A, that was how much we were pumping in every year. So that should make sense. If I increase how much I'm producing each year, long term, I'm going to have more. And it will decrease if we have less. But then notice it also depends on B. The bigger B is, the less stuff we're going to have long term. Does that make sense? Because what does a big B mean? It's going down at a larger rate. Yeah, we're losing stuff faster. Well, if we lose stuff faster, in the end, we should have less overall. So we can get all kinds of combinations here with growth and decay. But the key is to look at it as how is the quantity changing? Can we build our Q prime? And in this case, Q prime, it was, well, we're adding in a certain amount every time. And then we're removing stuff exponentially. That led to this differential equation, which then we got here. All right. So this was a linear first order, so we could use linear first order techniques. However, there are other techniques we could have used here. Anybody see another one we could have done? Well, how about this? It's separable. Let me rewrite it real fast. So we have Q prime equals A minus BQ, right? That's how we had it at the start. If I rewrite this, I can get DQ over A minus BQ is equal to DT. So this one's separable. 
because A and B are constants. And if you go back and you look at our linear first order stuff, and then when we got to separable, I think I mentioned that when P and Q or P and G or whatever we called those functions, if they were constants, it turns out it's separable. Well, if you can recognize it's separable, this is going to be a lot faster. Because now think about what you're going to do to get your solution. It's going to integrate both sides, right? So if we integrate the dq over a minus bq, and we integrate the dt, this is going to give me negative 1 over b, natural log of a minus bq. And that's going to equal t plus c. If I multiply by minus b to move that to the other side, and then convert it to exponential, I get a minus bq Just remember what that solution looked like. So we're going to get a minus bq is equal to c e to the minus bt. But again, I want to solve this for q. So let me move things around. Dividing by b. You know, so we get A over B minus C E to the minus BT. So we got exactly the same form. It was just a lot faster because we saw that it was separable. And that's the other thing I want to point out is that for a lot of differential equations, there's more than one way to solve them. Uh, one of the ways I saw on how to find the integrating factor was also as sort of to look at the left side as a sort of product rule and um, try and find the integrating factor in order to make that product rule work to multiply onto both sides. Then you can just separate it into your product rule, quote unquote, and then integrate both sides. And I, I did that method uh, instead of using the Q1 method, and I got the same exact result, which is really, really cool. So, Yeah, and, and it should, because if you go back and look at how we derived our method for yeah. the whole Q1, we started with the let's assume product rule. Yeah. And so that was the generic how do we do it, um, and so the fact that you're looking at product rule, find it makes total sense. Cause that's what we Got are it. doing. Okay. But I think, I think maybe what it is the, is that that makes you feel a little more comfortable because you're not seeing it as all these steps in this process. You're more just looking at it, just looking at it yeah. and going, Oh, this is the kind of form I need. And you're able to kind of figure it out in your yeah. head instead of going through the actual steps. Yeah. Um, but yeah, looking it, at the I mean, structure of it and seeing, oh, uh, it's clearly this. Right. And integrating factors, it's always product rule. Yeah. We're always undoing product rule because we're taking, you know, u times y1 or mu yeah. times y1 or whatever. And that's a product. So then when we differentiate, that's product rule. Yep. All right, so there's an example where we could actually have growth and decay at the same time. Um, you can actually have growth and growth or decay and decay at the same time. Like here's an example. Let's say we're doing, we have a savings account. And um, so our savings account is gonna earn compound interest, continuously compounded interest, right? Whatever money's in there is gonna earn interest and it's just gonna grow. But we're being smart about it and we want to have, you know, a good retirement. So every month we're putting in a hundred bucks, right? So if you think about that in terms of a rate of change, it's going to look a lot like what we just did here, 
except instead of having the minus because we're taking away, we're going to have a plus because we're adding to it. So let me just get one set up. We won't go through the steps, but you'll see how it's exactly the same kind of form, which would lead to the same kind of problem. All right, so let's say we're doing this. Let's say we're putting in a thousand bucks a year. All right, so uh, we're saving a little bit each month and we're gonna put a thousand bucks a year into an account. And then we also know that that account's gonna earn us some interest. So let's just call it 5%, nice easy number. Let's see what that differential equation would look like. So in this situation, it's not growth and decay, it's growth and growth. So here's what this would look like. If Q is our balance, so let's write Q is the account balance, what we'd see is that Q prime, that's gonna equal well, we're gonna have a thousand bucks a year. So I'm just gonna put a thousand dollars in. Mm -hmm. And then I'm gonna to add to that my 5% growth rate on my money. So 0 0.05 times however much I already have. So this is another linear first order. It's also separable, however you want to see it. But we would use the exact same techniques. And I'll actually show you what this looks like. The solution to this one is going to be CE to the 0 0.05T, which should not surprise you, right? Because we're going to get the exponential growth. But then if you actually run the numbers on this, it probably feels a little bit weird but it's minus 200,000. You may remember that the other one, we had a plus A over B. This one, we get a minus A over B, just because of the fact that this thing is a plus instead of a minus, but that's why there's that minus 200,000. But it basically is exponential growth. It's just shifted down by 2, 200,000, and that's just the number that's necessary to make it that we're increasing a thousand every time. But look at what's gonna to happen to this over time. As T progresses, this is gonna grow and grow and grow and grow and grow without a cap, which is what would happen in the real world. If you kept putting in a thousand bucks a year, you never touch that money. It's gonna to continue to grow without bounds. So again, think about how I formed this. I looked at how is the account balance changing? How is my quantity changing? And I really just need to construct my differential equation that way. So the goal with any of these is to just figure out how is my quantity changing? And if you think about it in science, that's what we do. We go out and we see how things have changed. We go count the number of coyotes. Six months later, we go count the number of coyotes again. Six months later, we count the coyotes again. We're trying to look at how they're changing. And if we can figure out how the population is changing, then we can use a differential equation and get our function. All right, so any questions on this example? Hopefully you notice how it's really similar. It's just, they're both positive this time. Okay, so the next example I wanna show you is a physics example. Um, and this is Newton's law of cooling. I don't know if you've seen this before, you, you may have. Um, you may have also seen it in science classes, like it's something that we talk about in chemistry, I know. Um, but Newton's law of cooling is basically looking at what happens to the temperature of an object when it's put in an environment that's not the same temperature. So I'm gonna talk about it as Newton's law of cooling, but it could also be Newton's law of heating, right? Like think about, you know, you, you go to the fridge and you get a nice cold root beer, you set it out on the counter, it's gonna start warming up, right? 
Same thing if you've got a hot cup of coffee, you pull it out of the microwave, you set it on the counter, it's going to start cooling down. That's what Newton's law of cooling is all about. So let's just think about this. Let's just go to a cooling example. So we've got a hot cup of coffee. What do you think is going to determine its temperature later? What kind of quantities are going to matter? The ambient temperature of the room. Okay, for sure. What, what is the temperature of the environment that it's in? Because you take that hot cup of coffee and you put it outside on a summer day. I, I don't know why you're drinking hot coffee in the summer, but uh, you, you put it out in a, on a summer day as opposed to you take that hot coffee and you put it out in a, on a winter day and you put it outside. There's going to be a huge difference, right? So the temperature of the environment, the ambient temperature is definitely going to matter. What else do you think might matter? Is it the thermal capacity of the liquid or? That can definitely play a role. Um, if, if uh, and I think just about everybody except for West two here may, he may not know exactly what we're talking about there. <laughs> but um, when we talked about, um, in thermodynamics, when you talk about specific heat, specific heat of an object. Oh, Ian, yeah, you're going to find out about this pretty soon because we'll talk about it this quarter. So specific heat is the, quanti is the characteristic of material um, that uh, basically allows for heat transfer. And so if you have a high specific heat, it takes a lot of energy to change temperature. Um, so if you change your specific heat, it would definitely affect things. So um, this would be why, for example, antifreeze in your car has alcohol in it because it's, uh, it, its properties are such that it changes how quickly it cools off um, and also its freezing point and things like that. Um, another one that matters is like the container. And you guys know this right? Like think about if you've got a hot cup of coffee, it's going to keep its temperature a lot better if it's in like a thermos or, you know, um, in like a styrofoam cup or something like that, that um, helps restrict how much heat transfer there is. So there's going to be a lot of other stuff that matters. Um, but what Newton saw, and it's called Newton's law of cooling because he kind of came up with it, is he saw that, that the change in the temperature it's actually proportional to the difference in temperature between the object and the environment. So if there's a huge temperature difference, like let's say that the outside world is uh, 20 degrees C, but our cup of coffee is at like 80 degrees C, there's going to be a um, much greater change in temperature, much faster change in temperature than if our coffee's at 21 degrees in that 20 degree C environment. And the same thing if we're talking about something colder that's warming up. So our ice cold uh, bottle of root beer on a hot summer day. So this is what that differential equation actually looks like. You're gonna have, we'll call it, we'll go ahead and keep calling it Q. But for Newton's law of cooling, we're going to get that Q prime is equal to, there's going to be some proportionality constant. And I'm going to write here Q minus T, where T, this is your ambient temperature. So it's the temperature of the environment. So the further off we are from T, the greater the change in temperature. And you probably have noticed this, that if you have a hot cup of coffee, it cools down pretty quickly and then gets lukewarm, but stays lukewarm for a long time. You don't actually notice the change in that temperature as much as you do initially. But there's one more thing we need here. And what we need is a minus sign. 
Why? Why does that minus sign have to be there? Because it's cooling. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> and it does, it, it comes from cooling, like Mike is laughing about that, but yeah, no, it definitely comes from the fact that it's cooling. Because think about this, if our temperature, the object's temperature is greater than room temperature, Q minus T is gonna be positive but we can't have a positive rate of change. That would be saying our temperature's increasing. So since we need our temperature to decrease, we slap that minus sign. And notice that this also works for heating up, right? If our root beer is colder than the outside temperature, this is now negative, but we don't want a decreasing temperature. We need an increasing temperature, so that's what that minus will do. All right, so there's the differential equation for Newton's law of cooling. But check this out. This is identical to what we just did. And when I say identical, I mean, no, not all the letters are the same, but First I mean order, identical separable. structure. The exact same kind of differential equation. Because let me distribute it. Get Q prime equals minus KQ plus KT. K and T are constants. T is your outside temperature. K, that takes into account all the other stuff. The thermal capacity, the containers, you know, uh, ability to transfer heat, all that good stuff. But this thing is linear first order with constant functions. So I'm not going to bother solving it because we've already solved some like this today. But it's going to give us exactly the same form as what we saw when we did the radioactive decay one where we kept pumping in the same amount. Remember the one that was like B over A plus you know, the e to the minus kt. That's what we're going to get here. We're going to get some c e to the minus kt. And then we're going to add to that a certain amount. Um, I'm going to go ahead and solve it for you. I'm not going to go through the steps. I'm just going to give you the answer. Because I want to talk about the structure of this and why it does what it does. But we're going to get t plus c e to the minus kt. Uh, the little t is time, the big T was that ambient temperature. But this is what we get. And it looks, like I said, exactly the same as that radioactive decay one. But notice what happens as t goes towards infinity. This exponential piece drops to zero. And we find out that the temperature approaches t, our environmental temperature. And if we were to draw the graph of it, this is what it would look like. So here's our ambient temperature T. And we'd see a graph that does something like that. It will have an initial temperature, right? We just pulled it out of the microwave and it's got a temperature of 80 or whatever. And over time, we're going to see it dip and approach the ambient temperature. And if it were a, a Newton's law of heating, notice that nothing changes here. This structure is still going to be the same. But what would change if this was a cold bottle of root beer that was taken out on a summer day? OK, so, so Ian just started doing this with his hands, right? We're gonna see something different. It, we're gonna change our initial starting point, right? We pull it out of the fridge and it's really, really cold. It's like one degree C, because that's how we like our root beer. But it's still going to approach T. It's just gonna do something like this. 
but it's still going to be the exact same form. It's just what ends up happening is the C value ends up being negative. So now we're subtracting something from that T, but what we're subtracting goes away. So it's just a matter of changing our initial condition. So Newton's law of cooling, heating, they're really the same thing, but yet another example of differential equations. All right, so let's do one more. Let's look at one more today and then we'll call it good. Um, and this is a mixing problem. So here's the setup for this guy. I'll actually give you a specific situation. But we call these mixing problems. Um, I have a different name for them that you'll understand after next time. But here's what's going on. Suppose that we have a tank and this tank holds water. We're going to be dumping water in. So water is going to be coming from somewhere out here. And at the same time, we're going to have water that's coming out. And we're going to set this up so that this thing right here has a 100 gallon capacity. And we're going to start with fresh water. There's just fresh water in this tank, 100 gallons worth. But we're going to start pumping in salt water. So the salt water that's coming in Let's say that we know that it contains one quarter kilogram per gallon of water. So that's the salt concentration. And let's say that it's flowing in, but I'm going to give it a generic R right now. Okay, but we're going to flow in at R gallons per minute. So five gallons per minute, 10 gallons per minute, two gallons per minute, whatever. But it's going to be flowing in at that rate. But every gallon contains one quarter of a kilogram of salt. All right. So that salt water is coming in and mixing. And what we're going to assume, just to make the math a little bit easier right now, is that it gets evenly distributed instantaneously. So you may not like that assumption from the real world perspective, and that's okay, because that's not the greatest assumption, right? I mean, think about it, we're, we're putting this salt water in. Yeah, eventually it will diffuse its way into even the bottom of the tank, but at the start, it's not really gonna do that. Um, if this tank had like a big stirring mechanism, it'd be more likely that that's happening. But we're just gonna go with that assumption because otherwise it gets way too complicated to try to model. All right, so we're just gonna go with that salt water comes in and then pretty much gets mixed up so that that water container now has homogeneous water. So it's all the same and it's got that salt evenly distributed, okay? So again, reality, eh, but we're gonna run with it. Okay, so that's what's going on with it coming in. Now going out, let's say that we've got that set up, this, va this valve at the bottom is set out, set up so that it's flowing out at the same rate. All right, so every minute, five gallons comes in, five gallon goes out. Two comes in, two goes out, whatever. But we're going to assume that they're actually the same. So here's what I want to do. I want to see if we can create a differential equation that models a situation and then see if we can solve it. So what we got to do is we got to figure out 
how is the amount of salt in here changing? All right, so here's how this is going to go. We're going to, let's let Q, this is going to be the amount of salt in the tank. So I'm just going to put that in a box so that we remember. So this is going to be the number of kilograms of salt in the tank. So if we started with fresh water, Q is zero. And over time, we're going to get more. Right? And we don't necessarily have to start with only fresh water. We could say that this tank initially had 10 kilograms of salt in it or something like that. And then Q would equal 10. But Q is the amount of salt that's actually in the tank. All right, well, let's see if we can create a differential equation for this. So how is the amount of salt in the tank going to change? Isn't the concentration going to go up? Because okay, we should expect it to go up because we're putting in salt. Well, let's just talk about this. Let's think about it this way. I'm going to write in minus out. The amount of salt that we have in that tank is going to change. And it's going to change by looking at how much is coming in and removing how much is going out. So let's think about coming in. We know it's coming in at one quarter kilogram per gallon at R gallons per minute. So if I want to know how much is coming in, I need to multiply these two numbers together. Right? If it was five gallons a minute, I'm bringing in five-fourths of a kilogram. If it's 20 gallons a minute, I'm bringing in five kilograms and so on. So my amount in is going to be one-fourth times R. Mm -hmm. So you guys buy that for how much is coming in? Yep. Right? It's that's the concentration of salt times its flow rate. Okay, so now let's go to out. I'm gonna erase the in bit here because we already used that. So how much salt is going out? However, the some amount that's already in the tank. All right, we, we want to do the same thing, right? We want our concentration times the rate. Well, we already know that the rate out is the same. So I'm going to go ahead and put here times R. So the question is, what's the concentration of salt inside right now? Could you just call it? Ooh, would it be Q over 100? All right, so what makes you think Q over 100, Dia? It's the amount of salt in the tank over the total volume of the tank, which would be the concentration of yep. it. Yep, and that's exactly right. This is going to be Q over 100, because it's the amount of salt divided by how many gallons we have. Right? It's kilograms per gallon. Just like this one-fourth was kilograms per gallon. It was one-fourth of a kilogram for every one gallon. So that is exactly how we got that. That concentration comes from, it's the amount of salt divided by the volume. The amount of salt, we just don't know what it is, it's Q but we do know that its volume is still 100 gallons. All right, we'll check that out. What structure is that? What type of differential equation? That's separable. <laughs> it's separable. It's a linear first order. It's exactly the same as the ones that we've seen before. 
this is actually identical to the one that we just did with Newton's Law of Cooling, which was identical to the one about the decaying amount of radioactive material. We're putting in the same amount all the time. We're losing an amount that's proportional to how much is already there. It's exactly the same structure. So you can go ahead and solve this just like you normally would. This time we're going to get Q is equal to 25 plus C E to the minus R T over 100. So as time goes on, this part goes away. And what we should expect is that in the long term, we're going to end up with 25 kilograms of salt in the tank, which should make sense. Because remember what the proportion was that we were putting in? We were putting in one quarter of a kilogram per gallon. Eventually, it's going to be all like that. And so one fourth of this volume will be salt. One fourth of 100 is 25. In terms of what C is going to be, well, that's going to depend on our initial condition. And of course, we'd also need to know R. But notice what R does. If R is bigger, that means that this exponential piece goes away faster. So bigger R just means more salt water is coming in faster, right? It's coming in faster. So we're pumping the salt water in quickly, which brings us to that maximum amount of salt sooner. The other kind of cool thing is that there is a max in terms of how much salt. Sometimes it seems like there shouldn't be because we're just always pumping in more salt. But we're also removing, right? We're taking away. So there's going to end up being a maximum amount of salt that we can get. But that limiting value actually makes total sense for what we expect. Okay, so the moral of the story for today. We've now talked about like three or four different scenarios, completely different scenarios, right? We're talking about savings account. We're talking about radioactive decay. We're talking about cooling. We're talking about mixing in a container. And yet, Every single one of them brought us to the same type of differential equation. To a mathematician, that tells me they're all the same problem. All of these things are identical problems. They're all exactly the same. So that's what you kind of want to look for with these. It comes back to what I talk about pattern recognition is going, oh, I've done this problem before. Yes, I know this is about mixing salt, but I've done this problem before. And so now I can let, you know, the total math monkey free and just do my thing. I don't have to think anymore once I get it set up. That's where the monkey mathness isn't in differential equations, is the construction of the differential equation. But once you've got it, yeah, just turn yourself loose. Okay, so next time um, we're going to keep looking at examples. And in fact, I'm going to vary this example a little bit. And we're also going to go back to Newton's law of cooling and we're going to change that as well. We're going to make it more realistic to the real world. Uh, basically, we're going to let our ambient temperature change, right? In this example, we're going to talk about what happens if we allow um, a different rate in versus a different rate out. So um, see what happens there um, and just kind of keep moving with the same idea of let's construct differential equations and see where we need to go to solve them.